Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in this webinar that we're doing for the City of Las Cruces Economic Development Department called Realizing the Value of on an Untapped Workforce. And actually, today we have a great panel in which we're going to be discussing the different aspects that we have about a very good potential for workers now that we're struggling to find workers as uh, the year 2022 continues to run and we're trying to find out uh, what might be the best sources and how can we use some of the resources that are already existing uh, with individuals that have had uh, different instances throughout their lives and, and, and that potentially second chances can be granted to, to a lot of them. So today we're going to be having a great panel and I'm going to be doing kind of like the brief introduction of the panelists that we have for today. For today, we have five great speakers. Initially, we're going to start with Mr. Peter Martinez, and I'm going to be saying a quick bio about Mr. Martinez. He has spent the last five years in workforce development. Four of those years were in leadership role assisting TANF clients, population in the southern eastern portion of New Mexico, as well as obtaining, uh, helping them obtain their career and educational goals. Peter's current role is the one-stop operator for the New Mexico Workforce Connections Office here in the Southwest New Mexico. And he looks to continue to be a strong advocate for the community members here in our region. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Francisco, I appreciate that. The second person that we have for today is gonna to be Ms. Lisa Belvito. Lisa was born and raised in Syracuse, New York. She completed a master's degree in food science at the University of Minnesota. And she has spent the last 18, well, she spent 18 years in the development of medical food industry. In 2006, though, she transitioned her role to be a full-time volunteer and became a career coach and an employment specialist, working primarily with low-income and at-risk populations. In 2012, she obtained an Offenders Workforce Development Specialist certification and began working with justice-impacted individuals, both in correctional facilities and throughout the community uh, reentry programs in St. Paul, Minnesota. Lisa, welcome. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Lisa. The third person that we have talking for today is Mr. Raul Rodriguez. And Raul is a lifelong resident of Las Cruces. He was raised in Mesilla and joined the military from 1967 to 1970, served as a combat medic, and he joined the military again in 1978 and retired in 92 as an infantryman. He graduated from Troy State University with a degree in business management and worked for the state of New Mexico at the Department of Workforce Solutions, then the Las Cruces One Stop Career Center, and then he held positions as the Disabled Veterans Outreach Program, Local Veterans Employment Representative, and finally with the WIA Supervisor. And in 2015, he has been serving as the Community Resource Specialist for the U.S. Probation and Pretrial Services here in downtown Las Cruces. Raul? I think he's there. I think you muted yourself, Raul, but that's that's perfectly fine. We'll, we'll, we'll take that as an acknowledgement. We also have the business community represented in this webinar. We have Robert Kautz, who has been working in the restaurant industry for the last 20 years. He is currently a general manager for a large corporate restaurant chain, and he does franchise and corporate acquisitions and mergers, as well as opening new stores. For many years, he has many years of, of, uh, of experience in staffing, as well as hiring employees that have had a difficult time finding employment. And Robert, welcome. And I'll hey, take you. Just go, I'm here. Thank you, Robert. And last but not least, we have Ms. Gina Franco. And Gina was born and raised in Mesilla Park after graduating from Las Cusas High, and she continued her education at NMSU, where she graduated in 1999 with a, with a bachelor's in criminal justice and a master's in criminal justice in 2001. It, she followed her career as a probation uh, parole officer in March 2002, where she worked as a high risk, high needs offenders in the community corrections program. And she is currently the supervisor for Region 3, District 3C Special Programs Unit. Gina, welcome to our panel. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Gina. And actually, we're going to be starting with Mr. Peter Martinez. Uh, he's going to be discussing a little bit of the current situation that we have in the city of Las Cruces and our region, actually, for the Southwest region in terms of workforce. Peter? Thank you again, Francisco. Pleasure to be here with everybody and, and talking on a, on a very important topic um, to really start getting our, our gears uh, turning again uh, to, to restaff some of our 
uh, our workforce, uh, not just here in Las Cruces, but as Francisco mentioned, in the entire Southwest. So I wanted to start off today just by a little overview of, of the current workforce uh, state. Um, right now, we are we are getting healthier. Our economy is is, is definitely in a, in a better position than it was uh, this time last year. Uh, the city of Las Cruces right now reporting for March uh, of, of 2022, we have a unemployment rate of 4.8%. Uh, that's actually down 2% from what it was in February. Um, and it's, it's substantially down from what it was this time last year when we saw a 68 as of March 2021 uh, unemployment rate. So we are we are getting back uh, to normalcy, but we understand that there's still industries that are still hurting, uh, that are still having uh, issues with um, filling vacancies. And as uh, Francisco alluded to, uh, there is a population that uh, we have kind of turned a blind eye to, I think for too long. And it is now the time to really start looking at that population. And that's our justice impacted individuals. Uh, as again, Francisco alluded to, these individuals, there's always been a stigma, you know what I mean? and a caution when it comes to, to hiring folks that uh, have felony records. Uh, but you know, as we move forward and as we try to rebuild our economy and as employers continue to, to rebuild uh, their, uh, their revenue and uh, the state of their businesses uh, due to the pandemic, uh, this is a, an amazing untapped talent pool uh, that employers can start looking to uh, utilize. Uh, so we have at any given time, you know, uh, here in, in the city of Las Cruces, over easily 100 individuals that employers could take advantage of and give an opportunity to showcase their self-worth. You know, I'm a strong believer that everybody deserves a strong uh, second chance at life. Uh, these individuals, uh, I think we have to remove the stigma and we have to give them an, an opportunity to showcase, uh, again, their self-worth. So right now, just a, a little bit of the metro industry I wanted to share. Uh, as of March here in Las Cruces, uh, is, um, we saw a total, uh, excuse me, total non-farm employment was up uh, 4,500 jobs um, or 6.3%. Uh, we had leisure and hospitality was up to uh, 2,200 jobs. Um, or a 3.8%. Uh, the, uh, the following private sector industries also reported uh, growth, which were trade, transportation, and utilities, up 500 jobs, or 4.6%. Uh, uh, professional and business services were also up 400 jobs, or 6%. Uh, education and health services uh, were up 300 jobs, or 1.8%. Uh, manufacturing was up 200 jobs, or 7.1%. And then obviously we have miscellaneous other services were up 100 jobs or 7.1%. And then lastly, uh, our mining and construction were up 100 jobs or 2.6%. Uh, in the public sector, uh, local government also saw 900 jobs or 10.3%. And our federal government was up 100 jobs or 3%. And state, uh, and state government was actually down uh, 400 jobs or 5.3%. So we still have opportunity to continue to uh, triage the situation that the pandemic put us in. And, you know, uh, again, this untapped uh, population of job seekers um, deserve an opportunity to showcase what they can do and how they can assist us in rebuilding our economy. So uh, this is a great discussion, uh, you know, and, and hopefully we can have employers start looking at this population and, and taking full advantage. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Francisco, for having me here. Thank you so much, Peter. And, and that's actually a perfect segue into how to identify them, that, right? Who, who are they? Uh, what skills do they bring with them as they're transitioning out of the justice system? And, and actually, it, it is a lot about the education from, from the end of the businesses as well, as well as the the perception that we get, right? Getting away that stigma that, 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 that Peter just discussed. Lisa, would you discuss please about reframing the belief system in the way in which we think about this on top potential? Thank you, Francisco. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and, and thanks, Peter, for that great 
uh, promotion of this population and you know the things that you said. So, as Francisco mentioned, I've spent about nine years working with justice impacted individuals, primarily in in the employment um, issues and arena. So. Um, resumes, interviewing, what kind of job do you want? What do you want to do with the rest of your life? And I, I heard so often from these folks, they would look at me and very sincerely say, I'm just a criminal. I'm a felon. And, you know, and they would shrug their arms and like, what, what, what am I going to do? Who's going to hire me? And so I would, I would challenge them to reframe that. And I would encourage them to look at that differently. And what I would say to them is, you know, that that's not true. You're a parent, you're uh, a friend, you're a student, you're a welder, a nurse, an accountant. You've got all these different qualifications. And yes, you're right. You have a felony in your background. You made some poor choices. You made some poor decisions. But I would, I would ask them, don't define yourself first and foremost by what was probably the worst decision and choice you made in your life. Give yourself some credit for the other things that you've done, the skills that you have, and who you've become as you've gone through the process of being involved in the justice system. So one of the things I'd like us all to think about right now is many of us, I'm not gonna say all, but many of us have made mistakes. We've made bad decisions, we've made bad choices. I know I did in my somewhat misspent youth. And I think the key is we didn't get caught. We got a clue about life. We figured out that we had to straighten up and fly right before we got caught, before we had to face the, both the legal and the social consequences of being in the justice system, before we had that term felon and felony attached to our names for the rest of our lives. So we, you know, we were fortunate and we made good decisions. My, I guess my, my ask and my message for everyone then is don't judge this population. Don't disqualify them only based on the mistake they made, the bad choice and the poor decisions that they made. Look at them as individuals. Talk to them, be willing to hear a little bit about their story. Look at all of the, the skills, the qualifications, the experience, the soft skills, the attitude that they have to offer. And then make a balanced decision when you look at, at these candidates and your positions. Do they fit? Are they right for your organization? Are they right for that position in total with everything that they that they have to offer? And um, you know, these these folks could end up being your best employees. And I think you'll hear that from some of the other speakers. They could end up being your star employees because you gave them a second chance and because they are grateful and loyal. So that, that's just my sort of message to everyone and, and all of us is reframe your beliefs, reframe how you, how you look at them as total individuals and, and make some balanced decisions and we'll give them some opportunities. Thank, Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for that. And, and it is a great insight to think in that regard, right? We, we all did uh, something, we just didn't get caught. And that is actually the, what makes a difference, right? And it is actually a base that I would like to transition this into more of the, of the experience and the, and the training in the, in the capacity that these workers have that are transition, transitioning out of the justice system, that I'm actually gonna be opening up this question for the three uh, remaining speakers that we have for Raul, we're going to also be pulling in for Robert and for Gina. And, and Raul, I, I would like you to, to go first and take a stab at this. What are some of those soft skills? What are some of the of the hard skills that individuals that are transitioning out of the work, sorry, of the of the justice system uh, carry with them? What are some of the of the things that that you have seen recurrently? What are some of those uh, soft skills of, of in terms of uh, of things that they have innate, but also in terms of, of things that they have learned within the justice system or that they have practiced in the past. Thank you, Raul. And then we'll pass that question to Robert and Gina. Thank you, Raul. Well, to start with, uh, 
you know, sometimes some of these guys have some training while they're incarcerated. There's a there's a big organizations that have uh, prison industries. So sometimes it has some very good skills. And the best one I think that I can use right now is, is the, the correctional facility in Phoenix. Uh, if you ever go visit them, they have several programs. One is a bakery program and they bake all the baked goods for the public schools in Arizona. Uh, they have the welding program and they do the, if you ever been to uh, national parks where they have these little barbecue grills, they make those barbecue grills there and make a lot of other things up in the welding program. Um, they have a carpentry shop where people send them exotic woods from all over the world and they make furniture with that. That's how skilled they are that they're being given access to uh, exotic woods to create furniture. And they also have what they have their, their wild horse program. They train horses for police departments, the border patrol, and everybody else. So they come out of, a lot of times they'll come out of incarceration with some really good skill sets. Um, and just, um, if somebody just gives them the opportunity, they can apply those skill sets to their re-entry into society. Thank you very much, Raul. And, and Gina, from your perspective, what are some of those soft skills? What are some of those hard skills that, that individuals that are transitioning out of the justice system uh, you, you have found with them that, that you see uh, once they leave? I mean, just to kind of piggyback up off of what Raul was saying, you know, they do, um, there are numerous things, especially with prison industries that where they learn carpentry and welding. And, you know, they make the furniture that are in all of the state buildings. Um, so, I mean, those are some of the skills that they can acquire um, when they're incarcerated. But I think on the opposite end of that, um, a lot of them come out with this need and this desire to please. You know, they um, have this resiliency about them where they've had to, you know, be forced to have to deal with situations that they may not necessarily have put themselves in, but they were there because of another uh, person, you know. So um, they're usually very eager to please and they're willing to learn, um, you know, and just. Uh, they can be a, a good, I guess, a commodity or, you know, they're, they bring, they just bring a different aspect in how they view life and how they view their success um, as just a, you know, a normal person that you could, any other person that you might just find, you know? Um, so I don't know, I think their resiliency and their perseverance and, you know, their, their willingness, their loyalty that they do have. And, and, you know, it just takes that one employer to give them that one chance and they will be loyal to you and they'll do whatever you know you need them to do for their success and for your success and and so i think that's that's something else on the other end of the spectrum that they bring when they're coming out thank you so much gina and and robert in your perspective from the business end perspective uh what are some of the skills uh, what are some of the soft skills or hard skills that you see uh, perhaps in your industry, right? What, what do you see as, as some of the skills that you have seen from this specific population uh, when you hire them? Um, hi, everybody. Um, you know, the more that I was, I was kind of thinking about it, I think they both said everything really well. Um, you know, one of my biggest things is, um, and I think you know was saying it really well is that when they come in, you're right, they do want to please, you know. And you know, my 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 biggest thing as an employer is, and I was talking to some colleagues uh, of mine about this as well uh, a couple of days ago, is, you know, we can get them a job, but can they also grow at the job, you know? And that's one of the things that kind of holds me back sometimes is you know, I can hire people on as, you know, crew or anything like that. But then when it comes to promoting to management or, or something that's going to be a little more, uh, you know, you know, uh, higher up, you know, that's when things start to get a little bit tricky, you know, and there's been in the past, I've had amazing people come up to me and be like, Hey, I'll work, I'll do a great job. And, you know, whatever I, I can do, I think you just muted yourself. You know, that's the.
I think you're muted, Robert. Sorry about that. Is that can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. So, you know, and that's always one of the things that I, so, but what, one thing that I've noticed that our company is starting to do now, and I think this is going to be something that other companies are going to start to follow suit is, you know, we can hire them on, but they're going to have to put some time in, you know, it's, and it's going to be difficult to hire as a manager or, or, you know, or something like that. That's going to be the, the difficult thing for us to get past, but you know, uh, we, like I do have an, uh, I do have a, a person that works with me and uh, he has felonies and, you know, basically uh, he's worked with the company for almost five years now and they're just now going to be promoting him. And, he, you know, so it, that's going to be another thing to think about. We can hire them, but then once they're hired, you know, how can I utilize them beyond just an employee? How can I bring them onto my company based on the record they have? Because once we do that record check, you know, that's when it's going to come down from up above. And that's where the education on our part is going to have to start. You know what I mean? So, you know, and that's, I, I, and I think out of a lot of the things that I think about, that's probably one of the top ones is definitely, you know, uh, what can, you know, I want to hire you and I want you to work for me. I know you're going to do a good job, but how, how can I help you grow with our company? You know what I mean? So, and I think the only way to tackle that would have to be honest from the beginning with the people that are even above me that could make that decision. But, you know, after talking to my, you know, my colleague and now we're starting to promote people, but it's just taking years for them to move up because they really want to see that that they're in it to win it and that, you know, uh, and get away from that stigma about being in the justice system. So. Thank you for that, Robert. And, and we have a comment from Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. So I was just going to say real quickly in terms of, of the skills, it's not only what they've learned perhaps in the prison industries, but a lot of these people had, had, very good jobs, they had a lot of experience, they had education, they were in the community before life took a turn and, and they got themselves into trouble. So, so they do also bring a variety of different skills across industries and across um, job sectors that they can still rely on and utilize once they've completed what they need to complete for, you know, for the justice system. So. Thank you, Lisa. And, and actually, that's a perfect transition to the next question that we have. And going back to you, Raul, and then transitioning back to the, to the same sequence, uh, which industries, Raul, have you seen have had the largest demand for these workers? And, and I guess kind of like a follow up for that question, if there's employers watching us currently, if, if they're interested in hiring or, or locating workers that could potentially be hired, what are the next steps? What would you suggest? Well, I, I think that the industry, it, it's not one specific industry. I think that all industries can be open to hiring our clients. Uh, we just have to reevaluate how we look at this population when it comes to employment. This population is, is made up of sons, brothers, sisters, mothers, uncles, cousins, of anybody that's out there that can be in the justice system. And what I always tell people is that you can get a job anywhere you want to, because I'll, I'll ask, uh, I do a workshop and I ask them all the time, how many think that you're not getting hired because of your felony? And just about everybody raises their hand. And I have to tell them, it's not your felony that's keeping you from being employed, it's, that you're not convincing the employer that you're the best choice for the job. So if you approach it that way, any industry can be open to hiring our clients. But I think that right now we're at a prime time where we need to uh, relook at uh, hiring policies um, and how we evaluate that population. Because it's a population that has a strong desire to be successful and not go back into prison. 
Thank you, Raul. Thank you so much. And, and Gina, from your perspective, is it similarly to what Raul is expecting or seeing? Is there any specific industry that you see any frequency in which they're hiring some of the, of the justice impacted individuals? And if there's employers out there willing to, to do this, what are kind of like the, the next steps for some of them? Well, I think, um, like Raul said, there's not really one specific industry. Um, I know a lot of our male clientele tend to um, gravitate towards construction jobs, um, you know, labor type um, employments. But, you know, we have people that are reporting to our office that have never been to prison. Um, some of them are not even considered convicted felons because of the type of sentence they receive, but they're still serving a term of probation with us. Um, and, you know, these people do have degrees. Um, some of them are nurses. There are some people that are engineers. And I mean, you know, the majority of the time, those, those people are already employed and, and have employment. But, you know, for, for the other, um, you know, population that maybe don't have that educational background and, and are looking for, you know, um, construction type work or any type of labor, landscaping, you know, gardening, anything like that. Um, you know, employers can always feel free to contact myself. Um, we have two transitional coordinators here in our local office that work with employers in the community. They work with our treatment providers, um, basically to um, help these offenders either, you know, um, prepare a resume or, you know, if they do have type workshops and stuff, we'll send them out for, you know, people to attend these workshops if employers want to send us information like that. Um, we do have um, employers that have contacted us and said, you know, we're hiring. Can you please pass out these flyers and have your people contact us if they're interested in working? Um, so, you know, there's always ways that we can promote, um, you know, these employment opportunities if, you know, by either contacting myself or I can put them in contact with the transitional coordinators here. Thank you so much, Gina. And, and Robert, and I know that you're focused on the, on the restaurant industry. But can you tell us a little bit about your experience when you are hiring justice impacted individuals? Uh, where did you start? Where did you look for? How, how, did, how did the process begin in the first place? Did they seek for you? Did you look for them? How, how did that work from your end as a business? Um, you know, a lot of uh, the first time I started dealing with it, I, you know, I was working for a, a big corporation and uh, we just we, it, it, it snowballs. It really does. You're going to get, the first time I dealt with them, I was dealing with people that were coming from a halfway house that were coming in. So, and those people, you know, have a little more, uh, they need a little more attention. Uh, you know, when they get to work, they have to call the halfway house. You know, the employer has to make the call saying they're there. You know what I mean? There's like a lot more steps involved. So, and then once one person finds out they tell everybody and then everybody knows and then it snowballs and now all of a sudden you have 20 applications you know what i mean like hey this is where i'm working and you know i'm doing good here and you know and that's pretty much normally the way that it works it's it's going to be a really large word of mouth you know what i mean and as much as you know we'd like to think we could just drop the information into people's hands and you know they know what to do with it you know there's obviously going to be two sides there's going to be the educational side for the employers and then there's going to be uh the word of mouth between uh you know people that are in similar situations you know and uh it's just going to come down to uh you know working both sides in my opinion you know what i mean and uh educating them and you know uh you know, once one person finds out, they're going to know somebody else. Or maybe they went to uh, probation and they were sitting out in the, the thing and they were talking to somebody else that's on probation. Oh, where are you working at? You know, they it's always going to be something where they know somebody or they have to go somewhere and they'll have a, a conversation and then it comes up, you know. And like I said, once you just hire that one, that first person and, you know, it's it it's just it becomes a really big word of mouth thank you robert and raul you had a comment on that yeah well, i think robert made a very good point about when can, for employers when they're considering our client um that a, a lot of times our clients have court-ordered conditions that they have to follow 
uh, which means sometimes they, they they might be called to do a UA or they might be they have counseling. Um, and that's why sometimes employers, um, they have to leave employment in the middle of the day to go do their counseling. And it, it's a touchy situation because of HIPAA laws that uh, it's a medical thing. So um, they, they get a little touchy sometimes, but it is important that um, employers understand that they do have certain court ordered conditions that they have to follow. So, uh, and you know, I can talk to any employer that needs to uh, talk about that if they're federal um, probationers, uh, I can certainly give them some information. Thank you, Raul. Thank you for that additional information. And in terms of that experience for the employer, right? And, and Raul, and, and let me follow with you on this, in this specific topic. Uh, what is some of the feedback that you have received from the employers when you have placed uh, justice impacted individuals uh, with them? In, in general, what, what are some of the, uh, of the of the discussion? Where does it go? Is it is it more on the negative side? Is it more on the positive side? What is the feedback that you have heard uh, from the employer side whenever they, they engage in, in hiring um, justice impacted individuals? By far, it's all been very positive. When the employees that have hired our clients, um, they find they seem to find them more dedicated than somebody who hasn't been in the, in the justice involved system. They're more dedicated. They're more willing to to go the extra mile uh, and complain less in the job. Actually, so they're very satisfied with them. Uh, and the the major complaint is that sometimes because they might get a job here, but they're from another part of the state. When they're released from here, they'll move back to wherever they came from. Um, so they lose that employee, not because they didn't want to stay in the job, but he, he went back home. So that's the biggest complaint is losing a good employee uh, when they leave. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Raul. Uh, Gina, from your perspective, what is some of the feedback you have received uh, from the employer side, whenever it, you have worked in placing uh, justice impacted individuals? Um, I think, you know, we've, we've had kind of both. I mean, we've obviously, um, employers, we've always, we've always informed employers to, you know, if there's ever any issues or you, you know, please don't hesitate to call us, you know, because we will, we can also come and, you know, um, reinforce what they're, what they're trying to have them do. So if they they're suspicious of anything, you know that the that the um, client might be doing, or they might not feel, you know, that they're being truthful with them. So you know, we've had both. We've worked in conjunction with each other just to help the you know the offender better succeed. Um, but I mean, we've never really had any negative feedback. It's all been pretty positive. You know, obviously you know, not everybody's a great fit for every position. So, you know, there's those trials and, and, um, you know, we have to see if it's going to work or not, but, but the majority of the time it's been, it's been positive. We haven't had any negative feedback and, you know, generally the placements seem to work. Um, so, you know, we just keep, keep plugging away and keep <laughs> trying to get everybody employed and, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll find their spot where they're successful. Thank you, Gina. Thank you so much for that. And Robert, from your perspective, what is some of your feedback uh, regarding uh, whenever you hire some some of the justice impacted individuals? Um, I mean, uh, honestly, I mean, I remember one year uh, we we must have hired probably close to 20, 25 people. And um, the people that were coming from the, the halfway house were fantastic because they had a ride to work, you know what I mean? They want to be at work because they don't, you know what I mean? And they they just put so much effort in. They know that, it, that they have to work hard and they know that it's a big deal and they take it very seriously. And to be honest with you, same with the rest. I mean, they were just, they have, you know, they're trying to turn their life around or they're trying to make good and they don't want to go down that same path. And I have nothing but positive things to say. Yeah, If I felt you know, that this wasn't a good mission, you know, I don't think I, you know, I wouldn't want to be a part of it, but I believe in what we're doing. And I believe, you know, especially with the stuff that Lisa says, and, you know, and everything that, you know, we're trying to accomplish. And uh, I have nothing but good things to say, I can't, you know, like I said, 
and uh, like Raul and everyone else was saying, is that we have to also understand that there are, you know, some people have a lot of court ordered stuff, you know, they have to leave or they have to, you know, but normally those type of people, even though they're going through those situations, they're usually very communicative. But hey, boss, uh, this is happening and, you know, I'm going through this and, uh, you know, this day, normally they know well in advance the things that they need to be doing. You know, it's not going to be a surprise. So even if they tell us like the day before or two days before, well, and, and normally it's pretty set schedule. I've noticed too, when they have to be somewhere or anything like that. So, I mean, as long as they're just upfront about what's going on and when they can and can't be there, it's really easy to work with. It's, it, it is, you know, and I, I, like I said, nothing but positive things to say. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you for that. And I, we're, we're approaching the end of, 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 of our webinar, actually. We have a, just a quick announcement before we start doing some of, of the quick wrap up. I think it was gonna go for a bit longer, but I just wanted to go ahead and ask any of the attendees whether there's any questions that you may have. Um, and I know we have four attendees, we had six, uh, but for the attendees that we currently have, are, are there any questions that you may have currently for any of the panelists uh, regarding the, the things that we have been discussing currently. Actually, I think you can raise your hands and I can just press a button to allow you to talk and that, that should be perfectly fine. Any questions from any member of the audience? Clear as mud? Probably, right? <laughs> well, if there's if there's no questions from the audience, I, I do want to do one quick uh, wrap up, uh, at least from from the panelist perspective. And and I just uh, kind of like I would like you to 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 say uh, openly what what are your thoughts uh, uh, regarding this topic? What are some of the challenges? And what are some of the things that if that if you wanted a business or someone that was watching this to get out of? this conversation what is the value added that you can add to this conversation right now and and lisa i'm going to be going back to you if you can start with with that discussion uh really quick uh, for wrap up what is your your takeaways or your value added that you would want individuals to get out of this webinar i think it really is that these are individuals with unique stories and unique life experiences, not all of them positive, but they have a lot to offer. They have a lot to give. They want to be back in society. They want to be pro-social. And so I would say, just think about them as individuals. And if you found this at all interesting, useful, you want to pursue it, um, Encourage your fellow business owners and, and employers in the and your members in the community to listen to this. It's going to be recorded. Encourage them to listen to it and, and help them to think a little bit differently about this population so that they can be useful members of society and, and grow in your company and grow in, you know, in, our, in our city and help make it a better place. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Uh, Raul, what would be uh, one key takeaway that you would want individuals watching this webinar to get out of? Well, I think the, the thing that I want to talk, to, talk about right now is really the, the benefits to the employer of this population. Um, one thing, one note that I'd like to make is that it costs, and, and these are federal statistics, it costs about $37,000 a year to keep somebody incarcerated. So if we put somebody employed, that money comes back into the community, uh, into our economy, and, and they pay taxes. There was a study done by Peter Coase and Lee Bowes back in 2015 that found out that the sooner somebody gets employed after leaving incarceration, the likelihood of them going back into the system dropped like 80% depending if we got them employed. Uh, and then also the other good, the other positive about that is if we get these people employed, it's the security of the community. They're not out there 
doing anything bad anymore. So that reduces crime and everything else. And that's important. And I don't know if Peter was going to address this or not, but uh, there's also the work opportunity tax credit and the federal bonding program. Um, so if, you, if Peter's going to talk about that, I'm not, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but we had those two programs that um, employers can take advantage of to take some tax credits um, and to hire somebody if that, that's bondable. If you could, Raul, just uh, perhaps briefly elaborate on what, what the, the WOTC and, and what the federal bonding are about. Okay, the work opportunity tax credit and federal bonding are both uh, under the New Mexico Department of Workforce Solutions. That's who manages them in the state. The work opportunity tax credit provides a tax break if you hire anybody that falls in that, in that category. And in New Mexico, I think that last time I looked, there was 14 categories of clients that qualify for the tax credit. The tax credit is dependent on how long they stay employed. So if they stay employed for a long time, you can get some pretty good tax credits per person. Same thing with the federal bonding program. Federal bonding program is if an employer's insurance won't cover somebody, they can apply for federal bonding. And by the way, there's no paperwork at all for the federal bonding. They just call uh, the folks at the state and uh, if they qualify, they get federally bonded. Only protects against theft. That's it. So it makes uh, people a little bit more, more comfortable when they hire somebody, they have to get bonded. Thank you, Raul. Thank you for that, that brief description on that and for your, your, your key takeaways. Uh, Gina, uh, for your key takeaways, if you want someone watching this webinar to get out of this uh, today's conversation, what would be that value added that you would want them to leave with? I think the number one thing that I could pause, like if I could get my point across, it would just be, you could be that one person that could make a difference in this person's life. And it just takes one person, you know, they've been judged by society. They've been judged by, you know, the community and, and, and everything. They've, they've paid their debt. They're trying to make themselves a better person. Um, a lot of them are trying to break these generational cycles that they've found themselves in and you know it just takes one person so you could be that one person and you know you could possibly break that cycle for them so just you know keep an open mind and and hopefully you know you might make a difference in somebody's life thank you gina that is that is very very meaningful uh, uh, Robert, in terms of uh, from your end, uh, what would be some key takeaway that you would want someone watching this webinar to get out of? Um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of us at the uh, employers at the end of the day have the same common goal. And what that's going to be is definitely that, you know, we want to hire people that want to work, want to show up, want to do a good job. And, you know, I as an employer, I've always found that you know, uh, as you guys call it, justice impacted, you know, people definitely do show that, you know, and I mean, if you could have a person come in, you know, with a difficult background and you don't know about it and they come in and they have a great interview and then you find out later that maybe, you know, something else, like, you know, sometimes you just don't know, you know what I mean? And I think people need to definitely uh, open up their minds a little bit and think of it as also it's a business, you know, we got a business to run and, you know, what do business things need to run? You know, we need people and we need dedicated people. And I think that's what a lot of uh, justice impacted, you know, uh, employees tend to bring. They definitely bring hard work, they bring uh, dedication, and they definitely uh, want to do better with their life or else they wouldn't be there in the first place. You know what I mean? Uh, and, you know, and that's just a lot of my personal experience that I, I've done. And I think that, uh, like I said, as we educate more and people understand more that, you know, it'll definitely be uh, a mission that we can accomplish together. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you so much. And now just kind of like to, to wrap up really fast. Uh, can you please tell us your, uh, if, if there's someone interested in contacting you 
in terms of uh, they have questions or they have a follow up or they have a question where to contact you. Uh, would you please briefly say your name, your phone number and your email address? And I'll start with you, Lisa, uh, so that you can help us in case there's any questions from any of the members of the audience looking at us. And if you don't feel comfortable saying it, you can just tell me I'm not comfortable saying that. So that's perfectly legitimate. No, I, I can certainly say it. I, do, you, do we have the ability to put it in the chat so people can see it? I guess that's what I yes, was we, we can do that, but I, I would like it to, to hear because people that are listening to this from the recording, uh, they do not see the chat. So they, at least okay. they, can, they can pause it and, and write it out. Yes, but we, for the people at the audience right now, we will be emailing that information uh, to you as well. Okay, so uh, Lisa Belvito, last name is B-E-L-V-I-T-O. I am at lbelvito at lastoscruces.org. And you can reach me by phone at 575-636-0549. Thank you, Lisa and Raul. Hey, my name is Raul Rodriguez. Um, my phone number is 575-528-1530. My email is long, so I have to kind of look at it a little bit, but it's Raul underscore, underscore Rodriguez at nmp.uscourts with an S dot gov, G-O-V. Thank you so much, Raul and Gina. My name is Gina Franco. My email is gina.franco at state.nm.us. And my contact number is 575-343-7257. Thank you, Gina. And Robert, maybe just your email if you're in the willing to provide your phone number that that's perfectly fine I, under, I completely understand robert <laughs> no I, I honestly I don't, I don't mind but i just want to congratulate raul on that email address i mean i, I bet he thinks about that email address every day <laughs> hey raul can i get your email address i mean he must I, I he smiled when he gave it out so uh my name is robert uh last name is couch c-o-u-t-s uh my email address is fusion f-u-s-i-o-n d-c at gmail.com and my phone number is area code 915-407-3020. Uh, Thank you so much. And if you have any questions about any of the programming that we have today, this is coming because of the efforts of the Economic Development Department at the City of Las Cruces. My name is Francisco Payares. Now I'm realizing I forgot to introduce myself. Um, and you can reach us out at fpayares at las-cruces.org. And also at my phone number, uh, it's 575-528-3060. So with that said, we also invite you to visit our page and we have a job fair for tomorrow. So if you are hearing this or if you are willing to go, we have a job fair at the Las Cruces Convention Center from two to six on May 12, 2022. Uh, from two to six, May 12, 2022 at the Las Cruces Convention Center, we have a job fair going on. So if you have nothing to do or you, you're looking for a job or you're looking to, to put some people at work, that is your chance and your opportunity. With that said, thank you so much for joining us and have an excellent lunch. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to the panelists that have joined us for today. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you for everything. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.